All right, welcome to today's webinar, Preparing for a Multi-Cloud World with Bernard Golding. Look, all the way from the States, and thanks for giving us your e evening, Bernard. Um, today we'll be talking about cloud adoption trends, the challenges in agile infrastructure presents for application lifestyle, um, cloud management, and how to build a cloud-ready organisation. Um, Bernard Golden's the CEO of Navica, a consulting firm focused on cloud computing and DevOps. Um, and services clients across the globe in all areas of cloud strategy. As, to, as always, today is very interactive. You've got your Q&A um, little task screen down there. Feel free to send questions through there. Um, the chat's open as well as we'll do, be doing a couple of polls. With no further ado, over to you, Bernard. Thanks for your time. All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me, Ross, and thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak to your organization. It's a pleasure. I'm always happy to interact with Australians and uh, love the country. And um, yesterday, as we were preparing, Ross said, oh, yes, we're located in Brisbane. And I said, you know, we have a city about 10 miles from where I'm located with the same name, but everyone here calls it Brisbane. So whenever they hear, meet an Australian and the Australian says, oh, uh, you live around Brisbane, they go, no, it's Brisbane. Anyway, but it's a pleasure to interact with Australians. As uh, Ross mentioned, uh, this presentation, you can submit questions and I have the Q&A box and I will attempt to address them as they come along in the presentation, which I always think is better because you get questions answered immediately. So if you have any, uh, go ahead and put them forward. And uh, Ross assured me that you, this audience is representative of Australians everywhere, which means you're very straightforward, um, state your opinions frankly, so I'm looking forward to that. Let's go ahead and get started. And this slide says the cloud management challenge, but many organizations, the reality is they deal with multiple clouds. And so the discussion here and the recommendations really fit for multi-cloud environments as well as a single cloud environment. And we're going to be talking about kind of the challenges that organizations face as they adopt cloud computing, the kinds of challenges they face as they try and migrate their organizational practices to cloud computing environments, and some of the issues that get raised when they start thinking about, well, how am I going to manage applications in those environments? So let's go ahead and jump in. Let me start. Um, I think I'm going to get going here. So, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorting out the relationship between the webinar software and PowerPoint. So, uh, as Ross mentioned, uh, I'm the CEO of Navica, and I've worked in cloud computing actually since it was be called, before it was called cloud computing. It was called infrastructure as a service when Amazon first announced it, and I went to a meetup nearby here, located in Palo Alto and saw a fellow from Amazon talk about this new thing they'd off launched called Amazon Web Services that offered infrastructure as a service. And I went, that, it just struck me, it was like an amazing enlightenment. And I said, that is the future of how IT will be done. And I began working with it very intensively at that time and have consulted with companies really all around the world. And over the last five years, I worked in a couple of software companies that actually op offered products in the cloud management space. One was called Instratius, and that company was purchased by Dell, and one was called ActiveState, and that company was purchased by HP. And so I have a lot of experience both in what it takes to offer cloud management and multi-cloud management, but also the kinds of challenges that organizations encounter when they move toward that environment. And that's what I'll be talking about today. I'm Cloud Computing Advisor for CIO Magazine. Wired.com was kind enough to name me one of the 10 most influential people in cloud computing. And I've written four books on virtualization cloud computing. And Amazon Web Services, Four Dummies, was named one of the top five books in the entire domain. And here's a set of pictures of them. No need to elaborate that. I want to begin by talking about what's going on in the, in the computing industry. So not just talk about cloud computing as a kind of an isolated, oh, what kind of functionality does it offer, or how do you access it? But what are, what's going on in the industry? And cloud computing is having a profound impact on the computing industry, the practice of IT. And it's important to really under, understand that because 
that will affect the computing substrate that you'll be using going forward. So February 2nd, excuse me, I'm just going to, whoa. I have to apologize. This uh, I'm trying to move the Q&A out of the way, the Q&A box out of the way so I can see the text on the slides and everything's just, as I said, I'm struggling a little bit trying to get Zoom, which is the webinar stuff, and PowerPoint to, to cooperate. Obviously, I'm not being enormously successful. So February 2nd, which was about uh, two months ago, a little over two months ago, Amazon announced their financial results for the quarter. And as part of that, they announced their AWS numbers. And by the way, they will be announcing their Q1 numbers in about 10 days. And those will be very interesting. So for the end of the year quarter, October through December, Amazon Web Services did about $3.2 billion of revenue at a 56% growth rate. In January 2017, Microsoft estimated its numbers. Well, I shouldn't say it, I should say it differently. Microsoft announced its numbers. It doesn't break out Azure from an overall category it calls cloud computing, which includes Office 365 and a lot of other stuff. So it's hard to really discern exactly how much cloud computing they're doing in that overall category of cloud computing, how much sort of programming services and uh, infrastructure equivalent to AWS that they're doing. But the analysts estimate that they're doing a yearly about one to $2 billion, but at a 100% growth rate. So that's two of the, what are really the big three, the third one being Google. That's what they're doing in cloud computing, what their revenue stream is looking like and what their growth rate is looking like. And by comparison, VMware, which is a real stalwart of, of the enterprise software industry, did about $2 billion over the quarter, but it's only grown about 9%. And that was really great because most of the other big players, companies like Dell, HP, IBM, Cisco all announced numbers that actually had them shrinking, that they were had reduced revenue from they had from what they had the year before. And IBM just announced its results today, about five hours ago, five or six hours ago, and it suffered a 20th consecutive quarter of reduced revenue year on year. So basically that means over five years. IBM has been shrinking. So when you contrast this, it's a world where the cloud is growing incredibly rapidly. And most of the traditional players in the IT industry are shrinking. So that's a backdrop of what's going on sort of in the industry. And this gives you an idea of where these revenues are likely to end up. If you extrapolate that 50% growth rate for Amazon Web Services and that 100% growth rate for Azure, so it's growing more rapidly but off a smaller base, by the time you get out to 2020, they're going to be doing almost $100 billion of revenue, so a very dramatic factor in IT. And really, that means that everyone who's listening to this call will be encountering and using cloud providers as a pretty significant part of their revenue stream. I'm just uh, I'm struggling with all of this, uh, Ross, Ross, I apologize. Now, that's what's going on on the provider side. Let's talk about what's going on, on the user side. And uh, we'll talk about that. And I just had a question pop up saying, hi, Bernard, do you see any future for the VMware and IBM clouds? Well, <clears throat> the VMware cloud, which they called vCloud Air, they just sold off to a French company called OVH. So VMware itself does not have any plans for public cloud environments. They um, have announced a partnership with Amazon, which as far as I can tell is going to offer vSphere in a public, from a public provider. That was announced oh, a few months ago and it's supposed to come to fruition sometime this year. Uh, not really clear what that's going to be. So, sorry, Ross, you, you, you marked it as answered before I got finished with it. 
And so now I, I got to go back a little bit. And in terms of the IBM cloud, um, I hear really mixed things about it. Obviously, they put a lot of emphasis on it in their numbers today. They said it was huge. But again, it's hard to know exactly what gets thrown in with that. Um, we'll see. I said there was the big three. You might say it's the big four and include IBM. Not exactly clear to me. And I apologize for not being able to say more about that. But it's even people who work with IBM and use IBM's cloud kind of confess that it's a little mystery to them exactly what's going on with it. So that's where that stands. So turning back to what the users are doing. So JP Morgan did a survey. So this is on the financial side of things, not so this isn't a technical analyst, this is a financial analyst. They surveyed 200 large enterprise CIOs. And the average IT spend of those IT organizations was $600 million. So obviously very significant. Now that varied from rather small ones that spent, spent maybe 10 or $15 million a year, all the way up to IT organizations with budgets of multiple billions of dollars. So generally speaking, you say this is a very large enterprise survey sample. And what they found was that there's going to be dramatic growth in cloud adoption in the near future. They asked them, what proportion of your application portfolio is currently being deployed into public cloud environments? And what proportion do you expect to be there in 2020? And um, yes, we have a push poll right up here, a quick poll that's sort of asking you the same question. What proportion of your non-SaaS applications, in other words, packaged applications that you've obtained from a vendor or that you've built yourself, are you currently running in a public cloud environment? Zero to 10%, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, or 30% 30 plus? If you could answer that, that would be very interesting. But JP Morgan found that these large enterprises said, well, we're running about 16% of our application portfolio in public cloud environments today. That was 2016. But by 2020, we expect that number to be 40%. So a very large proportion. In other words, trending toward half of their application portfolio going to be running in public cloud environments. So obviously, if you're an IT organization, public cloud is in your future. All right. Well, um, so we've got the results up here. And uh, it looks like a fair number of you are really not using public cloud or just beginning to use it, 39%. But 10 to 20%, there are a full quarter of you are at 10 to 20%, and nearly a quarter of you are at 20 to 30%, which is pretty, pretty strong adoption. It's very interesting. And 16% of you are at 30% plus. Now that I have to say, I did not expect. So um, it looks to me like Australia is a more public cloud forward environment user base than I might have expected. And I fr think, frankly, that most uh, ob observers or commenters on the market would would have expected. So that's quite interesting. Thank you very much for that information. Now, in terms of what JP Morgan found, so obviously clearly this is a huge deal, but the key question, one that they didn't ask was, well, what's going to happen after 2020? In other words, it's 41% in 2020. Does that mean in 2021, it's going to be 41%? Or does that mean it'll be 45%? In other words, will it continue to grow or maybe will it shrink? Maybe you'll, these organizations would start pulling applications back or will it level off? And I guess it wouldn't take any uh, Sherlock Holmes to figure out that I, my perspective is I think it's likely to continue to grow. The, the factors and forces that would induce organizations to put applications up in public cloud environments aren't likely to stop at 41%. I believe that there will always be some proportion of an application portfolio for an IT organization that will remain in a, an on-premises environment for reasons of uh, difficult to port. They use certain kinds of 
capabilities that aren't available in public clouds. Maybe there's some kind of uh, compliance issues. I think there'll always be some that'll remain on, on, on premise, but I believe that there's no reason to think that the vast majority of applications won't follow the same trend. So this is what's going on on the user side. We've talked about the vendor side. We've talked about the user side. Now let's talk about what that means. Okay, so cloud is a big deal. It's going to be a huge part of every IT organization's future. What does that imply? Well, let's talk about the expectations, the implications of what that means. In old computing, you know, it typically it took months to availability. You said, I need some resources. I want to put an application up. Uh, you know, you started today, months from now, if you were lucky, you might have those resources available. It tended to be very static. You know, you put it up and it was really difficult to change. And that was kind of always frustrating, really hard to scale. Because if, you know, your application took off and all of a sudden you had five times the user count that you expected, that was a big problem because if you needed more resources, you were back to that months to availability, requesting additional budget, having to purchase the equipment, get it installed, et cetera, et cetera. You had to pay for it all up front. Basically, you bought what you forecast. You would do some kind of um, capacity planning. You'd figure out what you thought you'd needed, and you had to pay for it all up front. And guess what? You always guessed wrong. You know, you either bought more than you needed, and so you were sort of wasting money in a sense, or you bought less than you needed, and you had an application that was overloaded and people were unhappy with. And this was very much an infrastructure-focused discussion. How many servers do I need? How much storage do I have to buy? How many network ports will I need? Well, cloud computing completely changes that dynamic. It's minutes to availability. You request re resources, they're available in 10 minutes. It's very dynamic. You can change it at will. You know, if you want to add additional resources, it's trivial to scale them. And by the way, it's trivial to release them if you don't need them any longer. And you pay for what you're using. So it's very much tied to usage. That's what is cost you pay for. And by the way, you pay for it as you use it. You don't pay for it all up front. The nice thing about this is it enables you to have all of your focus on applications. You don't have to worry about infrastructure. You let the provider worry about the infrastructure. You worry about your application. So with that, that really changes the dynamic of what you expect from your computing environment. You now are going to be able to focus on your application. That's where all of your attention is going to be focused. And you can start doing things like this. This is a, a, an example of an application that Capital One, which is a large US-based financial services organization, a bank basically, what they put together. And I worked with Capital One quite closely when I was at Active State. They were one of our customers and I worked with them in terms of their adoption and their plans for cloud computing and so forth. And when we first began working with them, they said, we love your company's product, but we're going to be running this all on our own infrastructure because of compliance reasons, security, etc. And about uh, six or eight months into our working with them, they came back to us and said, you know, we love your product. We want to continue using it. But we're going we're gonna to deploy these applications into public cloud environments. Um, we've concluded they're as secure or more secure than what we can put together. And the benefits that are just like what I just outlined in that last slide, they said that is the kind of benefit that we want to have. We're going to deploy into public cloud environments. And since then, they have become a poster child for cloud adoption, and in particular, an AWS poster child. So now that uh, we know that uh, many of you are pretty far along with your cloud computing stuff or, or using it, we want to understand what are you using cloud computing for? What are you doing with it? Are you using it to foster innovation? Are you looking to it to reduce your costs, which many organizations do? Do you want to get out of owning your own data centers? and kind of carrying that asset on the company balance sheet? Or do you have some other reason? And if you could sort of let us know, that would be really interesting. And let me go on to, this, while you're filling that out, let me go on to discuss or describe the, um, what uh, I, one particular application that, that Capital One did. Amazon has released this thing about uh, two years ago now called the, the Echo, 
which is basically a voice-enabled voice recognition device that can do all kinds of magic stuff. And uh, Ross, I confess I don't know the Australian market. It, are Echoes available in Australia? Can you get a hold of them there? I'm not hearing you. You might be on mute. Does anyone in the audience know that? I'm actually not too sure, to be honest. Um, I'll launch this poll though. Here's some results from the poll for you. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a good Maybe spread there. It's a good spread. Yeah, I've got a no for um, the, that product available in Australia, um, but you can import them from what people are saying. Yeah. Um, yes. It, with all the other responses to this poll, if you could put, you know, maybe send some of those through the Q&A so we can get an idea of what other is to you, that'd be great. Um, over to you, Bernard. Yeah, okay. So basically, they built an application that you can say to your Echo, Echo, what's my account balance? Or Echo, pay my credit card. And it in the back end, magic happens and that it, it will go off and pull back your balance and then Echo or Alexa, which is the service, you uh, will say your account balance is $375.73 or whatever it is. And that is built on an amazing range of AWS services. AWS Lambda, which is a functions as a service capability. I'm going to be talking about this sort of uh, the old IPS model here in a minute, but there's sort of a new model, functions as a service, where basically you just upload a code function into Amazon a triggering event that will cause it to be called. And when it comes time to be run, Amazon, AWS, loads it, runs it, and puts out the, uh, the output, all without you having to pay any attention. You don't have to worry about a virtual machine or instance. You don't have to worry about a container. You just say, here's my code. I'm going to tell you when it needs to be run. AWS, run it when it needs to be run. And so that's in the back end of this this Capital One application. Very so interesting. Some of the other responses were um, business continuity, um, yep. a D, uh, AWS as a DR solution, and continuity slash resilience. Yeah. Well, those are really good. Those are really good uh, answers. Business continuity, uh, disaster recovery, not something that I'm going to be discussing a lot here today, but it is a very viable use case for cloud computing. And mm. it's and it's good because everyone knows they should be doing it, but typically they fall short because it's quite expensive and quite challenging to run. Cloud computing gives you a real opportunity for that. Um, let me go on to the next slide. There's a couple other questions here. What is your view on how cloud build automation will mature over the next three years? Well, Ross said this was a really smart, forward-looking audience, and that's true now because you're about two or three slides ahead. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to get to that. Um, David said, do you see SaaS being mostly used as opposed to the other models? I'm going to be talking about that, but I think that every company is going to be using SaaS, and the other models really depend on sort of what kind of company you are and to the extent that you need to build your own homegrown applications. If you have self-development, and I think more organizations are going to move in that direction as you know, the phrase that gets used a lot here in Silicon Valley is software is eating the world, meaning every company is becoming kind of a um, software enabled offering. And that's how customers want to interact with them. That tends to mean that you have to be better at developing your own software. That's what makes you unique. But SaaS will be huge. There's no doubt about that. Someone said, uh, just said Bernard and an, an asterisk. I don't know what that means. Um, but, uh, and then somebody said Apple Siri and Microsoft Cortana. Um, yeah, those are very viable um, offerings as well. And Google's going to have one there too. Um, the, Siri is probably not as far along as um, Echo, but Apple has big ambitions there and they're moving it along. Cortana the same way. So uh, I believe that voice will become another mode of interaction just like we have desktop we have mobile we have IOT we're also gonna have voice and that'll be a huge uh, use case for certain kinds of interactions and certain kinds of applications and so we'll see all of those those in there 
I just use this example because it's one I'm quite familiar with, and it's kind of cool because, you know, mostly people are doing things like asking Echo to play music or tell them the joke of the day. Uh, many people have proposed to their Amazon Echo, uh, but this is an actual useful business case, and I wanted to bring it up because that's the audience we have here. All right. What cloud computing means for IT tools and processes? So, Paul, the question you put forward is just what we're going to talk about right now. To quote the great sage, this is Warren Buffett. He said, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. And what that means is something that wasn't obvious when there was one condition present, meaning the tide was in, there was water covering everyone. When the tide goes out, you all of a sudden see who's been uh, going without a very important piece of apparel. And he always talks about it in the terms of financial things like, you know, you only find out who's overexposed on risk once, you know, something happens like a financial crisis or something. But that this kind of statement is actually quite relevant for the topic that we're talking about today. The tech translation is removing one bottleneck exposes the next bottleneck. And this is a time honored thing in in computing in the IT industry. You know, when processors get faster, then you find out your access to memory isn't as fast as it needs to be, and they start moving cache onto the processor and so forth. Well, that's quite relevant for cloud computing and in particular for IT organizations because once they start using cloud computing, now that infrastructure is fast and cheap, application development and deployment speed is now the primary IT bottleneck and the primary business differentiator. And that's really what I preach all the time. Cloud computing sets a new expectation for infrastructure. And really, if you're an IT organization that's sort of sticking with the, I'm going to run my own application, my own infrastructure, and I'm going to be great with it, all that, those, those days are over. The new expectation is, if you can't make it available in minutes, I'm going to go find somebody who will. And that's increasingly public cloud environments, public cloud off, off providers. But what that means is, now that infrastructure is fast and cheap, how fast you can develop and deploy applications is now the I primary bottleneck. And if you don't get good at that, you're going to fall behind people who are who are good at it. And believe me, um, Capital One, they've put, they've spent tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, in their IT processes and tooling to get their application processes as fast as their what they're using now in terms of infrastructure. So. Um, I have a couple of questions. Let me jump into those real fast. What do you suggest the fresh graduates like me that can enter in cloud computing job market if I have no prior experience? Well, um, this is from Ali. Um, well, you know, it's like the old joke about, uh, you know, you can't get a job till you have experience. And how do you get experience? You have to have a job. But really, the opportunities for someone like you to make your mark in this world are I mean, they're trivial. You get free, up to a year's free cloud computing resources from Amazon or Google or Microsoft. You can take courses in how to develop applications, how to create certain kinds of things. You can take machine learning classes at absolutely no charge. You can develop these applications and then put your code up on GitHub and just go out and announce it. And believe me, there are people who are dying for those kinds of skills. Now, you know, you may not be getting brought in as a senior level, but certainly you'll be able to find opportunity at a beginner level, no question about it. Um, Paul Comer, I like to use the, ch the term chasing the dragon to describe those recurring bottlenecks. Well, that's another way to say it. Um, uh, but Paul, I'll tell you that uh, my thing about the you only see who's swimming naked when the tide goes out, um, it's probably more vivid than chasing the dragon, and that gets lots of attention. So addressing the application bottleneck, I, I want to talk about what this means for IT organizations. So the business driver in all of this, so every, you know, software is eating the world. Every company has to be capable of delivering its functionality through software-enabled stuff. It's either going to be an application, it's going to be a web interface, it's going to be an IoT device. So you need to be able to accelerate innovation because there's huge amounts of competition around this. So you need to have close collaboration between business and IT. 
you need frequent releases. You need continuous integration. And uh, so, uh, Paul, this is coming up, is your adoption of Agile and DevOps. I'm sort of lumping two things. One is about how you do development. One is how you do deployment operations. Is it nascent, meaning you're just beginning this adoption? It's used for new digital initiatives. So sometimes organizations say, the way I've done things traditionally with my traditional already established apps, I'm going to keep it the way it is. But on my new digital initiatives, I'm going to go to this new world. Or, you know, there are other organizations saying, this is all this is relevant for my entire application portfolio i've got to you know really start working on this er everywhere if you could answer that that would be great so you're trying to accelerate innovation that means that you've got to have agile stuff going on and again that sort of you know code as soon as somebody finishes and checks in a piece of code it goes through automated testing it goes through staging it may go through some kinds of load testing you're doing continuous integration across all of the different people who are working on it. So you don't do that sort of everyone checking your code. Now we're going to spend two weeks making sure that it all works together. So this is really around agile development practices. You're going to be adopting scrum and sprints and so forth. So it looks like about a quarter are you of you are starting with an agile DevOps kind of thing. Half of you are adopting it for your new digital initiatives, which makes perfect sense. Really, it's very difficult to come out with these new digital offerings if you don't have your application lifecycle process really um, accelerated and streamlined. And then about um, almost 20%, almost one in five, are looking to adopt it across your app, entire application portfolio. And I, I would guess that that's the end state, that most organizations may start with the digital stuff, the digital initiatives, but they're going to end up with, with it across their entire portfolio because really in this new world of you know software's eating the world is a kind of a catchphrase you know your customers won't accept oh yeah the new digital thing oh yeah that's whiz bangy and great and fast and easy to use oh that that existing application that's been around for a while oh we're gonna leave it the way it is and it's gonna be slow and clunky and inconvenient to use no there's, they'll just say, you know what, I'll go find another company, another uh, company I want to work with. I'll take my business elsewhere. Um, in terms of DevOps, what you want to start doing is, you know, increasing the throughput, making it faster and faster to get code that's been checked in, tested, um, integrated, and so forth. How fast can we get that into production? And so you need automated operations. That means continuous deployment, distributed monitoring and management. Because again, this is a uh, this is an infrastructure environment that's quite dynamic. You've got, you know, you're, it's growing, it's shrinking, it's being migrated to new machines, so forth and so on. You need monitoring and management tools that are dynamic themselves, that don't assume a static world. So you need both agile and DevOps in this environment to really match what the business expectations are. And so this really answers, uh, uh, I think, uh, I forget the uh, person's name. It was uh, Paul. This really answers your, your question or your comment about the DevOps uh, kinds of things, which is I believe that cloud computing is a forcing function for the changes in the application lifecycle. Because again, if it takes 10 minutes to get resources, but it takes three months to deliver an update, People are going to be saying, there's something wrong there, fix it or else. And then you're going to be putting this into cloud computing environments where you're going to be looking to boost efficiency. You know, the infrastructure availability, it's, you know, you can, because it doesn't take months to get resources available, that means you, the expectation is I've got a code change, I've got it ready to go into production. It should take me mere minutes to put that into production. I'm going to put it into a cloud environment because that's the way I can get infrastructure that can respond that quickly. I've got scale, scaling, elasticity, and resilience. Resilience is very associated with business continuity and um, you know, making sure that your business is always available to do that. The resilience is, is available through cloud computing, not as much through the infrastructure side of things, and not so much through, I'm gonna write an SLA that means my cloud provider has to do something magic, but really the way you design and operate your applications. And should be thinking about that. And you get cost effectiveness here. And many of the respondents in the earlier poll noted that cost effectiveness is one of the reasons you're using cloud computing. And then all of that application agility, 
the DevOps capability, the cloud infrastructure flexibility and availability feeds back into your business approach where you can start doing things like experimentation. You can do fast prototypes of applications. You can do a market trial. You can put it out and just and, and try it with you know, a portion of your customer base. When I was working with Capital One, they said, yeah, when we come up with a new offering that we want to try, we bleed it out to say 10,000 customers. Let them try it and give us really fast feedback. And then you can do fast follow-on. If it's successful, you can grow it very rapidly because you can take that infrastructure that's you know, easy to scale and you can build it. And conversely, if your bright idea turns out to be a dud, you just turn it off. You take it down. You don't have a long-term commitment to it. So all very attractive parts. So really the application process has to be modified once you start using cloud computing. Got some other questions here. Uh, well, let's see. Data ownership is more risks in the cloud. Well, I think there are things that you need to think through. It's not typically so much around security around data ownership, but there, depending on the in the country that you're in, there are things around data sovereignty, compliance issues, probably beyond the scope of what I can talk about, but definitely do that. Um, in relation to the above question, any particular certifications you can recommend vendor or OS specific? Well, all of the public cloud providers have certifications around how to use their, their services. And it would be remiss of me not to say that one of the companies I partner with, Simply Learn, is a cloud training company and they, they offer those kinds of certifications. There are other providers as well and you can get them through the cloud providers themselves. But you know there are certifications that you can get trained in and then get certified around. In terms of the providers, um, they also go through stringent certifications around data center security, compliance, and so forth and so on. And there's a lot of information around that. Um, and that addresses that. These the questions are coming faster than I can get to. Can DevOps exist without Agile anyway? Um, yeah, I think, you, I think you can. You can tool, you know, I've got a code change and I can get it in production really quickly. Um, I guess my overall message is, you know, this is a world of faster and faster expectations. And if your development process is still slow, the fact that you can then, when you finally get a code change available, you can get it in production quickly is less attractive, is less useful. So I think, you know, you've got to really address both. Um, do you see synchronized or hybrid cloud being an important transitional solution while Australia builds its infrastructure? I'm going to come on to multi-cloud and hybrid cloud in a couple of minutes. Uh, what happens when the cloud fails? Well, I guess you take a tea break. Um, you know, you could say the same thing about what happens when any infrastructure fails. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, at least in my experience, the public cloud, the big public cloud providers, I'm talking about the Amazons, Microsofts, Googles, IBMs, they are as reliable or much more reliable than a typical enterprise IT organization can provide. So, you know, there's no, there is no perfection in the world. We're humans, but, um, you know, you just have to plan for that. And by the way, when I talked about the resilience and application design, there are ways you can address this issue around, you know, when a cloud provider has a data center go down or something like that. There are ways to go about it. What about cloud data security? A lot of organizations don't like to put their sensitive data with a third party, how to change that mentality. Well, you know, uh, many of them come around and uh, you know, my, my belief is the ones that don't come around. Now there are definitely reasons why you have to have compliance and there may be things that dictate not being able to use a cloud environment. And I mentioned that, that there will be maybe 20% of cloud applications that continue to reside on premise. But if it's an organization that doesn't really have those kinds of absolute legal requirements, or industry requirements, but just has, you know, somebody in IT going, well, you know, I'm John sure I trust a cloud provider. I'm, I'm going to keep it on premise and it's safer that way. I think they're going to, you know, those are going to end up being the buggy whip manufacturers of whatever industry they're in. They're going to, you know, their, their competitors who are willing to adopt new technologies, new approaches will outstrip them, will innovate faster, will get better financial results and they'll go out of business. And I'm sorry if that sounds um, heartless, but, I think that's what's going to happen. 
Uh, what's your favorite set of tools to use to enable DevOps? Um, well, we're going to talk about that a little bit too. I mean, there are a huge range of uh, tools that you can use, and we'll talk about that. And I want to be conscious of your time. Um, next slide here. The IPS, and I mentioned this, the old infrastructure service, platform service, software service, that world is dead. And that's what this toe tag represents. There used there at one time there was an expectation you had very neat demarcations between these things. That is not true. The the big application, the big cloud providers, they now have offerings across all of these things. They offer infrastructure, they have platform services, meaning they have frameworks that you can use to build your applications. They have tool tool chains that you can use as your agile and DevOps tool chains, and they offer applications as well. And the next slide will dem demonstrate this a little bit, illustrate it. Um, what are the challenges with integration of applications across multi-cloud environments? Would it be better, better to move the application to the same cloud infrastructure for the purpose of integration? Well, you don't have to, but there's always going to be some amount of latency if you've got different environments and you get what's called, what I call functionality mismatch. I'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation. Um, it's maybe easier, but I expect most enterprises are going to have, going to use multiple clouds and they will be faced with the, with the issue of, I've got one application or a set of data associated with one application located in one provider, but I've got another application that needs to get at that data in another provider. So they're going to face those realities and have to address them. No way around it. And by the way, this is no different than any other domain in any other, in every enterprise that anybody's ever seen. I mean, every enterprise has three or four different databases running around and has to figure out how do we do backups and how do we, you know, migrate data and so forth. So this isn't unique to cloud. This is, you know, just a common enterprise IT thing. This is a screenshot as of about a couple of months ago. Um, of the services that Amazon Web Services offers. And the point is you've got compute, which are like virtual machines and so forth. Um, but Lambda, which is their functions as a service offering. Um, they've got storage, they've got databases, but really they start looking at things like what they call management tools, which are, you know, things that you can use to operate your application. This moves into the, as I said, you have, when you're using a cloud environment, you have to have management tools that can manage that. They provide these. They have a service catalog that you can use. They've got things around compliance that are would typically be used by a security organization. They've got a set of analytics. And many of these things are like what would have been called platform services. And some of them are things that are called, that we would characterize as SaaS. So they offer um, something they call Chime, which is, uh, I don't think it's listed here. It's been announced after this screenshot, which is basically kind of a go to meeting, go to webinar service that you can use to integrate with this. Um, they just offered a call center capability. Um, I think you're going to see a, our, our, our cat's tail uh, move along this. Every so often she says she wants some attention and she comes along. This is Star. And uh, when she wants attention, like any cat, she wants to do it. She is, she is my equivalent of that very funny thing that happened, what, a few weeks ago on BBC where the guy was doing his thing and all of a sudden his He's child coming. stomped in. Anyway. Um, I love it. You thought what it's about, Bernard. We're all, we're all here. It's great. So, and she's very loud, so you'll hear her purring too. Anyway, the point is that IPS world is, is broken down you now have all the cloud providers playing in all those levels, all those spaces. And that both provides an opportunity for you to build rich applications more easily, but it also provides something of a challenge to know how to use it correctly. Um, and what I call say is welcome to the world of infra platware. You know, it's a mishmash uh, mashup of all of these kinds of services and all these kinds of capabilities that are, that are going to be present for you and are going to be things you're going to be using when you build your applications. Because the point of all of this is how fast can I build and deploy applications? That is a key differentiator in this new world of software eating the world. And so you're going to be choosing among all of these. 
And this is quite relevant to the question that I just, that last question, which was the multi, using applications across multi-cloud environments and so forth. And we're gonna talk about that here. Oops. And by the way, how fast is this all changing? This is a chart of Amazon yearly feature improvements. And you can see last year they managed to put out a thousand improvements. Some of these were new services, like I just mentioned the Chime service and things like that. Some of them are improvements on services. So at the reInvent last year, they announced a new instance type, a new virtual machine type, where you could attach GPU processors to a standard x86 kind of instance. And that's very useful when you do machine learning because GPUs have certain kinds of capabilities that are very useful for machine learning, artificial intelligence applications. So this is a new instance type that's available. And, you know, this is reflective of how fast this world is innovating and the kinds of the challenges you face and how fast it's improving. It's really quite remarkable. Now Star wants to look at the screen her, itself. So old application services, IT was responsible for installation, configuration, management, and upgrades. You could use open source. And um, Paul, this comes back to your thing about what are your favorite set of tools. I mean, one of the things about open source is there's never just one. There's always more than one. There's dozens sometimes. And DevOps in particular is very rich for that. But the problem is you end up with kind of open source is what I call a science project. You know, it's, I'm going to choose this one and use this one and I'm going to use this other one and I think they can work together, but maybe I've got to write some custom integrations. You've taken on the burden of being kind of a software vendor yourself because it's costly. You've got to have all these things. You have to have people on staff who know the innards of them. You've got to keep them upgraded. You've got to integrate them, so forth and so on. It's, you know, the old phrase about open source is free like a free puppy or maybe I guess in my case, a free kitten. You know, you've taken on a burden with that. Um, it can be hard to scale. You know, you build this and say, I'm gonna run this many applications through it. And now all of a sudden you buy a new company and you've gotta be able to span it across many more. You got some scale issues. You do have a low lock-in and uh, you know, that's valuable. There is value in, I could choose different components or I could use this in a different environment. So you have to understand that. But all of these application services are what I call below the value line. In other words, no business unit, no product manager on the business side, no CEO is going to go, yeah, it's fantastic that you've built this DevOps tool chain that is applicable generally. They go, what about my application? Does this help my application? Does this spend help my application? And usually it doesn't. So it's sort of a, you know, it's below the value line for any given application. The cloud, cloud application services, the cloud provider takes responsibility for all that stuff. It's often open source as a service. I mean, many of these offerings from these cloud providers is really they just take components and they offer them. But they take responsibility for installing it, configuring it, making it available to scale, make sure that it's integrated with other things. So it's pre-integrated. Oftentimes they're, they're offered for free. There's no charge to use them. Or if there is a charge, it's trivial. It's trivial to scale. If you say, gosh, I just bought a new company and there's another, you know, 300 applications that need to start using this tool chain, no problem. It's the cloud provider's challenge or, or worry to deal with that. You do end up with high lock-in because every one of these are very idiosyncratic. I mentioned the functions as a service, very attractive, but every provider's functions as a service off, operates differently. And there are some efforts to try and come up with um, frameworks that you can use across all of them some challenge with that, which I'll be talking about in a moment. But the nice thing about this is these services, the cloud, they're inherently applicable to an individual application. So they're above the value line. They're associated with delivering an individual application and its functionality. So they're sort of there. You can just, it's easier to justify saying, I'm going to use these because they're associated with getting value out of this particular application as opposed to this is a general kind of functionality that I have to invest money in and doesn't really apply to any given application. So old application services, cloud application services. The challenge of open, and this sort of addresses um, one of the questions that came up about uh, um, multi-cloud environments and so forth. And I said, it's the reality is everyone's gonna be using multiple clouds. But one of the challenges of saying, I wanna take an approach that gives me the most flexibility that lets me use any cloud provider. 
And I know this very well because I was with two different software companies that addressed it and dealt with many companies that wanted to use it. One of the challenges with this is it's very difficult for somebody who says, I'm going to provide a generalized, generalizable capability to expose what I call below value line features. So below value line is all that infrastructure stuff. But even below the line, there are differentiations among the providers. So for example, I said, Amazon started offering GPU enabled instances. Well, if you're someone who wants to take advantage of that, it's below the value line. Does your open multiple cloud, multi-cloud management platform give you the ability to access those instance types and use those GPUs. And the challenge is many of the multi-cloud management platforms and so forth, what they do is they kind of offer you a lowest common denominator. We'll give you the five most common instance types. We'll make it you know, easy to use certain kinds of functionality, but you say, oh, well, but I wanna build my application with this other kind of functionality. It's like, well, we don't support that. And then you're faced with the choice of, do I use the tool? Or do I use the rich functionality? You also want to understand in your management, your application tool chain, even your DevOps uh, tools, how much do they give me exposure to the above the value line services? Those, so those are application specific services. Those might be analytics or those might be certain kinds of notification services, um, email services or queuing services, whatever it might be, can I easily add those into my application or do I have to do some kind of funny workaround that sits outside of my management platform? And that's inconvenient because then you've got to go two places to manage capabilities within your application. Not very convenient, very difficult, easy to up, update one side but forget to update the other side and that's a problem. CapEx versus OpEx, which is sort of back to the how much spend and where in the application value um, chain do I have to make that investment? Do I have to make that investment up front so it's kind of a CapEx? And when you're building your own DevOps tool chain, it ends up looking a lot like CapEx. You have to spend a lot of money up front to get the capability that you can then only begin using once you get an application. OpEx you know, is really tied to individual applications and associated with the value of that individual application. And the cost versus business value. Um, I don't... Uh, uh, this is outside the scope of this, but I believe increasingly businesses will start looking on their cloud costs and their IT costs as part of their cost of goods sold. In other words, you know, this is something I manage just like my manufacturing costs or the, you know, average cost to um, turn on a customer. What is the average cost of the IT functionality that is encapsulated inside my product or service? I need to understand that as part of my COGS and that will become an important part of the calculation around how I choose what functionality I use, where I choose it, where I deploy it, so forth and so on. Do we have any more questions coming in? You mentioned Azure uh, and AWS clouds. Do you have any stats on Office 365 SaaS service adoption. Well, it's huge. Um, and it's huge because, you know, Microsoft says we do this amazing, huge, like $10 billion, I think, of cloud. And yet people sort of think that their Azure stuff is one or two billion. Well, most of the rest of it, I think, is Office 365. So it's huge. But that's about as precise as anybody can get. Um, you know, and it's it's sort of head to head between Office 365 and Google. I guess it's called Suite or G Suite now, um, but Google, you know, the Google application suite, um, and they're both very popular, very popular. Sorry, I can't be more precise than that, Paul. So, in conclusion, um, you know, we're living in a world. The picture here is a food fight. I mean, it's an amazingly innovative, disruptive creative, challenging, frustrating time. I also think it's probably the best time ever to be in IT because increasingly IT is no longer about plumbing and it's more about how do we, how do we 
you know, serve our customers better. Uh, the catchphrase that I use is, you know, IT is, is no longer support the business. IT is be the business or I run the business. And so, you know, cloud represents an increasing proportion of the IT portfolio. We saw that in our first uh, survey here. And we're going to see more and more of that. And, you know, as I said, my belief is that ultimately most organizations are going to run 70 or 80% of their portfolio up in cloud environments. Um, the IPS worldview is dead. Really, it's a rich melange of services from the cloud providers, but that is can be more challenging because they have such a rich palette of services. You have to choose which ones are appropriate. And then you have to sort of struggle with everybody's, all these cloud providers, particularly their above the value line services, really are quite different. And it's very difficult to sort of say, I'm going to use a generalizable way of taking advantage of those. The value line presents the lock-in challenge. And, um, you know, lock-in gets a bad rap and it sounds inherently like a terrible thing. I mean, you know, who wants to be locked in? Um, but really, this has been present in IT forever. You know, when you said, I'm going to use Linux, well, then you were limited to Linux solutions. Or if you use Windows, well, now I've gone down that ecosystem route. Um, I'm going to use x86-based machines. Oh, that's a, that's a kind of a lock-in as well. So, you know, what I always say is figure out where lock-in delivers value and then embrace that lock-in because it's better than the alternative. But be aware of it. There's an ongoing tension between open and business value that you need to be aware of and need to think about and need to very judiciously make your choices. And really coming back to it, cloud computing changes everything. The, the, the practice of IT, it really is already dramatically different than it was a decade ago and will be unbelievably different a decade from now. And, you know, I really feel like that's down to cloud computing. Um, and with that, I think... I've sort of come to the top of the hour. I've come to the end of uh, material. Ross, uh, you know, this, I guess, maybe last call for questions or comments. Yeah, definitely. No, it's been fantastic. Look, had, I remember cloud, I'm not an IT background, but I, I was working in small businesses um, a few years ago when cloud really hit the market and, and got started being used quite heavily. And the one thing I noticed was people or businesses tended to not really consider the full offering that cloud gave them, they thought, well, let, well I'm not saving it to the ser server under my desk, I'm saving it now to the cloud. Um, but what it did for the businesses was create mobility, was create flexibility, you know, and, and uh, with access and as sales teams. Have you seen businesses really re-engineer what they do and how they do based on, you know, adapting cloud technology? Oh, yeah. I mean, inc increasingly. Um, and I sort of made mention of Capital One. Yeah. I mean, they are, they've, they're worthwhile looking up. Um, they've, they've completely transformed. They were a, tr a typical traditional bank. They had gone down the route of saying, you know, IT is a cost center. Let's mm -hmm. go outsource. We're going to really just, um, you know, run it as cheap as possible. And then their CEO said, you know, the problem with that is then we're just like every other bank. We have no way to differentiate and that's a big problem in the future. And we need to, we need to be able to build innovative new offerings to differentiate ourselves. And they completely changed that. They had to unwind all their outsourcing. They've hired an incredible, um, you know, they brought in hundreds, if not thousands of new IT people. And those IT people look like people you'd see working in startups. And uh, they've, uh, they've built labs. They've got one in New York, one outside of DC, one near me in San Francisco. So that's an example of a company. And increasingly, you're seeing more companies like that. GE at the most uh, recent, uh, I think it was the most recent, or maybe it was the previous one in the US, said, we've got 34 data centers. We're going to shut down all but five of them. And all the rest of it, we're going to move to public cloud environments. And they're completely reconstructing what they're doing. GE is very interesting. They're creating a thing that they, they call, I think it's Predix, which is a platform service offering where they basically want to be a, an industrial IoT platform. So that if you're a company that says, I need to build an IoT device that's, you know, receiving data or, you know, something like that, and then wants to send it back, 
they want you to use their environment. So they're completely transforming the way that they even think about what IT can do. Um, that's an example of a company. So, you know, this is going on more and more as companies, you know, move from, you know, I'm, I'm going to use this as a way to reduce my costs or get out of, you know, having to, you know, refresh a data center at a cost of 50 or $100 million and start thinking about using it for innovation, just like we saw in that uh, earlier uh, survey. Uh, so somebody said, great presentation, Bernard. Thank you. I'll take that not as a question, but as a comment. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Do you see cloud computing impacting on the major financial ERP applications like SAP or Oracle eBusiness? Well, I think it will, but in the sense that I think organizations are going to replace their on-premise package versions of those products with SaaS versions of those products. And if you, ask, if you were to ask me what I think Oracle's future is in cloud computing, I don't think Oracle is likely to become one of the major cloud providers like I just announced, it, not just announced, but just uh, described as you know Amazon or whatever. I think Oracle is going to build an incredible SaaS business based on offering business applications over the SaaS thing. I don't know, Star is making yourself known now again. Um, that's what I think will happen with, with those big packaged applications. I don't see many organizations say I'm going to build my own. That doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, but I think that they'll become things that you'll, you'll just access just like any other cloud thing. You know, uh, Ross, just like you said, they started saying, I'm not going to store stuff on my, I'm not going to put files on, under my, under the file server under my desk, put it up in the cloud. It's going to be, I'm not going to run my invoices out of a set of servers in my data center. I'm going to run my invoices out of an application that's running up in the cloud and let them worry about it. Yeah. I think that's the, what we'll see for those kinds of applications going forward. Right. Phenomenal. Look, Bernard, that's been absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, I, I know myself and um, all the, all the members appreciate your time and your effort. I know it's a uh, late in the evening there and thanks to yourself and, and stars. That's been a great, great presentation and made an, um, all the best and I um, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, we did a tag team presentation, me and Star. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's been fantastic getting a sense, of getting a little glimpse into what's going on in the Australia, uh, Australian market with those yeah. surveys. Um, different than I would have anticipated or expected coming in. So I learned from it as well. So I really appreciate that. It's been fantastic. And um, um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Bernard Golden on Twitter. And I always announce where I'm going. So if I come to Australia, I'll undoubtedly tweet that. And anybody who's in the audience, uh, you know, ping me and I'd love to get together for coffee, learn a little bit more about what you're up to and uh, you know, share some perspectives. So thanks again Fantastic. for inviting me. Fantastic. Thanks. And I've got a, quite a few people saying thank you for your presentation coming through. So on that note, Bernard, you have a great day and, and hopefully we'll get you back for another webinar at another time. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye.